Turn to Luke uh, 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke 2. And let us read the birth of our Savior. <clears throat> Luke 2, verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. God. Oh, oh. Turn to Isaiah 9 this morning. We, uh, we're going backwards in the book of Isaiah. We looked at Isaiah 40 last week and saw that the warfare was ending between God and man. Because the Lord was coming to atone for our sin, and uh, with the Lord's return, the glory of God was returning as well. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Isaiah was 700 years ahead of his time, and yet the Lord gave him uh, a glimpse into the excitement of the future. By the way, thank you so much for straightening me out last week, congregation, on the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars. And you did so with great um, volume, earnestness, and uh, apparently even eagerness. And all week I've meditated on that and given thanks to God that you were not a part of that seminary class I had to take years ago where you would have scrutinized me and no doubt given me a very poor grade. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for um, this day together, and uh, thankful for your word, and pray that your spirit will be our preacher today, and that we'll all have ears to hear and hearts to believe what you would teach us. So make us teachable. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Often you'll hear this text read, and uh, the reader will start in verse 2 for some reason. I don't know what the world has against verse 1. But uh, we're not going to discriminate. Verse 1 is equally important. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You've multiplied the nation, and you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. With the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. All flesh is grass. All its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Amen. Well, in this very uh, familiar and very beautiful passage, uh, the prophet reminds us that history was changing because the Lord was coming and his kingdom was growing. The first, history was changing. Verse 1, there'll be no more gloom. For her who was in anguish, in former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. In the latter time he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Zebulun and Naphtali were tribal 
territories to the north and uh, west of the Sea of Galilee and were often the first uh, territories to be invaded by foreign armies and the first to fall. And indeed, less than 20 years after Isaiah began his ministry, they fell again, this time to the invading Assyrians along with uh, all the other tribes comprising the northern kingdom. And Assyria came to town with their scorched earth policy and absolutely uh, defeated the northern kingdom, uh, deported the people uh, into exile, never to be heard from again, uh, left the, the, what they considered the riffraff behind, uh, imported uh, other conquered peoples, Gentiles, into the northern kingdom who in turn intermarried and repopulated the region uh, with people that came to be known as Samaritans, whom, as you know, were very much disliked by the Jewish people. Point being, it was always a very bleak midwinter uh, for these particular regions, Zebulun and Naphtali. They were the land of darkness, uh, the land of the shadow of death, as it were, precipitated uh, by their spiritual decline. These were people who literally walked in darkness. And to walk in darkness doesn't mean there was an eclipse of the sun. It means that their hearts were eclipsed and their hearts were blind to their sin and to their need of a Savior. And so they quite literally walked in a state of spiritual death or blindness, which is the condition of every natural man, isn't it? Every unbeliever has the same problem he or she doesn't understand his sin and doesn't understand the gospel and doesn't understand the love of God. You know the name William Pitt the Younger, uh, probably the most uh, intelligent prime minister Britain's ever had, and a good man, and a moral, upright man, but an unbeliever. And his good friend William Wilberforce was forever trying to convert him and finally, after, after many uh, futile attempts, uh, Pitt agreed to attend church with uh, Wilberforce. And they sat side by side on the same pew as uh, the old Puritan Richard Cecil preached. And Cecil brought his A game that day. He was at his best, and Wilberforce was thrilled because he just knew the Lord was orchestrating the events. And the, the, the sermon was terrific, and the service was terrific, and... Wilberforce couldn't have written the script any better. And uh, the service ended and they left. And before Wilberforce could say anything, William Pitt turned to him and said, You know, William, I haven't the slightest idea what that man was talking about. Israel had not the slightest idea what Isaiah was talking about. And by the way, oddly enough, that was by design. Because when the Lord called Isaiah and commissioned him to go and preach, he did so with a view to his preaching ministry being a means of judgment. Go and preach so that this people's hearts will be dull, chapter 6, and uh, their eyes blind and their ears heavy, lest they hear and repent and believe. Read for yourself in chapter 6. So Isaiah was going to preach. I mean, what a terrible job description. Preacher's worst nightmare, right, Arch, David? Isaiah was going to preach, and nobody was going to listen. A few days ago, I was concerned about Kristen because I heard her talking to herself. I was upstairs. She was downstairs, and she spoke. And the dog was with me, so she wasn't talking to the dog. Our great dog, Duke. No response. She spoke again, a little louder. I still didn't hear any response. Finally, she spoke with some volume, and uh, I heard music. And then I realized who she was talking to. You know? Alexa! Good old Alexa! Don't you have an Alexa in your home? Alexa always listens. Alexa always makes an effort to to comply with your desires and, and uh, submits to your demands. A little louder, Alexa. 
Next song, Alexa. Turn it off, Alexa. And Alexa usually comes through. There were no Alexas in Isaiah's congregation. But history was changing for this land of gloom and doom because, second, the Lord was coming. Verse 6, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Lord was coming. How was he coming? And coming with armies and swords and chariots. Now, Christina Rossetti said it well. In the bleak midwinter, a stable place suffice the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. That's how he came. And he was raised in Zebulun, by the way. Do you know that? You probably didn't know that. You knew he was raised in Nazareth, right? But Nazareth was a city in the territory of Zebulun. And according to Nathaniel, nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. And later he set up his ministry headquarters in Naphtali. Did you know that? Probably not, but you did know he set up his ministry headquarters in Capernaum, which was a city in that same region all of which was encompassed in the region known as Galilee, Galilee of the nations, because they'd been repopulated, remember, with all these foreigners. And so Nathaniel said, nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth. But he was wrong. He must have forgotten about Isaiah's prophecy, because Jesus came out of there. And Jesus did his, began his ministry in this area, and uh, he turned the water to wine there. Remember that great story? He saved the day at the wedding reception, and he healed a woman by the well in Samaria there. And uh, he healed a nobleman's son there, and he entered the synagogue, and he taught with authority there. And he walked on water there on that sea. The light of the world came out of there. The good tidings of great joy came out of this land of gloom and doom and darkness. Joy is a person. You know that? Joy is a person. And his name is Jesus. And he came to make his blessings flow as far as that gloom and doom and anguish and darkness and spiritual death existed. And to usher in what the hymn writer calls those glad and golden hours for those who otherwise were suffering beneath life's crushing love. Life can be so crushing. We're all aware of the Hollis's sadness at this time of year. This weekend I heard of the passing of Ray Little's daughter. You know, do you remember Ray Little? She was 19 years old, student at Belmont. We had a rousing tree lighting ceremony. Monday night, many of you were there. Sang carols, drank hot chocolate, met some of our new neighbors. Just a wonderful, wonderful, happy time. And near the end of the evening, a couple came up and introduced themselves to me, and I knew them, but barely, and from at least a decade ago, because their son, whose name was John, played baseball with our son John and played football against our son. And as we were talking, suddenly I remembered that their son took his life about a year and a half ago. And I brought up that subject, and it was a sweet conversation, but very evident that the pain was still raw and just as though it had happened yesterday. We are never far from tragedy, though. Never far from anguish and gloom and despair in this fallen world. But history was changing because the Lord was coming to dispel the gloom and the darkness and the sadness to make Christian men rejoice. Now you need not fear the grave because Jesus Christ was born to save. And now you hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this and God was sending a wonderful counselor in whom were hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he's sending a mighty God the word means a mighty warrior. 
El Gibor, a mighty warrior who's, who's able to defeat every enemy we have and who's able to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free and restore sight to the blind and even raise the dead. And sending an everlasting Father who's not stingy with these good gifts but loves to give good gifts and loves to lavish grace upon grace and give double for all of our sins and the Prince of Peace. He provides peace that passes understanding even in the midst of gloom and anguish. And he gives us peace with God by shedding his own blood for our many sins, satisfying the Father's justice, forgiving all of our sins, whatever they may be, as far as the east is from the west, and giving us new life. Is there anything else? <laughs> uh, did he forget anything else? Remember those beautiful words of uh, King Melchior when Amal's mother had tried to steal his gold overnight? She got caught. Then he found out why she was doing it. And he said to her, Old woman, you may keep the gold. The child we seek doesn't need our gold. On love, on love alone, he will build his kingdom. His might will not be built on your toil. He will bring us new life. And as she contemplated this luminous vision of such a wonderful king, she said, for such a king I have waited all my life. History was changing because the Lord, this wonderful counselor, mighty warrior, everlasting father, prince of peace, was coming. And third, last, his kingdom was growing. Verse 7, of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and, and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And you can ask even Christian people to list the attributes of God and zeal is seldom ever mentioned. Love and mercy and grace and justice and righteousness and holiness and Wrath, those things are mentioned. But he's also a zealous God, zealous to build his church and grow his kingdom and increase his government. And that same zeal that compelled him to cleanse the temple and drive out the money changers and compelled him to rejoice when he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and compelled him to set his face to go to Jerusalem and to remain on that cross when he could have called down legions of angels to, del to deliver him that same zeal is harnessed into a kingdom-building, kingdom-growing endeavor that hell can't stop, that the world seldom sees and therefore seldom believes. But we know better. We know better from Scripture. We know the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of David, as we read here, who will have a dominion that will be an everlasting dominion and a kingdom that will never pass away. And we remember what Paul said about him, that God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, and that he will rule from the Father's right hand until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And of course we know those beautiful, famous words from the book of Revelation that we hear sung so often, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. I know it doesn't look like Jesus has much of a kingdom, much less an, a growing kingdom of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. Well, where is it? <laughs> it doesn't look like it, does it? But learn the lesson of Scripture. From Daniel's rock in Daniel chapter 2, that a rock that was made not with human hands. To Ezekiel's river in chapter 47, to Isaiah's prophecy here, to Jesus' sermon about a little mustard seed that's nearly invisible that grows and becomes the largest of the garden plants of the increase of its government 
and his peace. There will be no end. He has a plan, and he has power to carry out that plan, and he has zeal to motivate the accomplishment of that plan. He will build his church, and he will increase our joy, and he will multiply the church, and every seat will be filled at the great salvation feast, and he will rule the world with truth and with grace. Way back in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, our family took a vacation to New Smyrna Beach, Florida. And while there, we learned that there's going to be a space shuttle launch at Cape Kennedy from 45 to 50 miles south of us. And it took a lot of willpower, but we managed to rouse ourselves from sleep at sunrise and stagger down to the beach to see what we could of the space shuttle. Sure enough, at the appointed time, there was a little bright speck of light, you know, rose and rose and rose. Finally went out of sight. Quite honestly, I wish I'd stayed in bed. <laughs> it was a little disappointing. Could have seen it better on television, frankly. So we hung around for a few minutes and admired the sunrise. And then we um, staggered back up the beach and up the boardwalk. And just as we were opening our sliding door, the earth began to shake. <laughs> Oh, this is a tremendous, thunderous roar. We didn't know what was happening. But we finally realized, hmm, that's, that's, the, that's the after sound. The after effects. The sound took 10, 15 minutes to, to reach us 50 miles away. I think the kingdom of God, my friend, is a lot like that. Don't make premature decisions and don't. Don't feel sorry for Jesus. Don't think he's losing. Because the Bible tells us otherwise. The world says Jesus was a nice man. He lived, he died, he went away. No noise. Isaiah says not so bad. History's changing. The Lord has come once. The Lord's coming again. And his kingdom is increasing. The roar just getting started. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for bringing us a new life, for delivering us from life's crushing load. Thank you for healing our broken, heavy heart, for ushering in your kingdom that will never pass away. We praise you for giving us ears to hear, praise you for your light shining in our own personal darkness. We praise you for transforming our gloom and our hopelessness into glad and golden hands. So receive our praise, receive our worship, receive our thanksgiving to Jesus Christ, the wonderful King, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In your name we pray.